thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, the CIS is a wonderful organization doing wonderful work. So it's an honor to be asked to speak tonight. Indeed, when uh, Greg called and invited me to speak in favor of the iconoclast, the uh, contrarian, the person who's voicing views not in keeping with uh, the sort of ABC television worldview, I sort of figured my ship had come in. This was pretty much as good as it gets for me. Um, I could talk about the patent idiocy and lack of one single tangible benefit that flows from all the pious acknowledgement of the traditional owners of the land genuflecting that goes on in this country. <laughs> or I could have a go at the Australian army with their recent television ads listing some of the desired characteristics of new recruits. And one of those characteristics was nurturing. I'm not making this up. <laughs> nurturing. You know, are they serious? Do they want to open a daycare center or do they want to actually go into Iraq and deal with people who chop other people's heads off? Um, and it just seems that the equality pieties trump everything uh, in this country. Uh, and I wrote this before I knew who was going to be in the audience tonight, but I, I thought I could have a go at the Australian R Human Rights Commission. You know the body. It's the one that didn't say a peep, not a peep, while 1,200 people died at sea under the former government and certainly didn't launch any inquiries. But the minute Mr. Abbott comes into office and the boats stop, uh, they launch an inquiry into the condition of children in detention. You know, the fewer children there are now than there used to be. Um, this is a body that pays its commissioners well over $300,000 a year. Even the race relations commissioner, he's the one who couldn't find it in himself to offer a peep of criticism of Mike Carlton, but he went to the wall attacking any attempt to repeal our awful, sort of despicable C Section 18C hate speech laws. So again, uh, I, I personally would close down the Human Rights Commission tomorrow, but uh, you can bet the Abbott government won't do that. Um, or I could have some fun with the Australian attitude to federalism. I teach loads of students, and the basic uh, Australian attitude from Canberra to anywhere else is that a federalism is just a bunch of duplication, layers of bureaucracy, and it's inefficient. This runs up against what they call in the philosophy of science the facts. Um, Look, when you look around the democratic world at the richest countries, they're all federalist, federal countries. Switzerland, Germany, the US, Canada, strong federal systems. Um, their top court hasn't killed federalism the way our top court has, where in all the big cases, virtually, they decide with the center. But the thing about federalism is it's supposed to lead to different results and competition and uh, improvement. The bit, you know, it's, it's not unlike the way people used to think that if you had a centrally planned economy with really smart people saying this, this factory will build washing machines and that one will build cars. This was going to be a really efficient use of resources compared to those crazy capitalists where 50 firms are building dishwashers and 47 of them are going bankrupt. Of course, the, the fact is that uh, competition and difference leads to more efficiency, but you would never know um, that federalism is a good thing in, uh, in Australia. I mean, you can count the number of federalists in our federal parliament in basically one hand. Um, used to be a few in the, in the coalition, but there's not many there left, and there certainly aren't any in, uh, in the Labour Party. At any rate, when Greg called me, he said, don't talk about those things. Talk about something you actually know about. So, <laughs> so I work in a university, and here's the general attitude that a lot of Australians have, that we have really good universities in Australia. They're tremendous, and look, uh, you just read about these ranking things. Here's my view. The Australian universities are really in a bad way, and I'm going to give you some reasons why you ought to think that. Um, to some extent, I'll be uh, talking about a piece I wrote in Quadrant. And normally, when I write things in the paper or the spectator, I get a lot of people who um, basically hate me. And they tell me, they find the time to send me an email, which is, I don't know what they're doing with their life. But uh, <laughs> at any rate. Um, but on this one, I got all happy emails you know, from people across the spectrum. All these left-wing people said, They'd start their email, normally I hate everything you write, but you got this right. Basically, there's a lot of room to fix our universities. We get a little bipartisanism. So here's the problem. Let me start with two laughable ones and then go to, to, to bigger problems. At my university, the vehicles all drive around with uh, the ones that are doing the parking enforcement, that sort of thing. Big thing that says um, emissions-free vehicles, zero emission vehicles. Now, we're supposed to be educating young people. And this can only be right if the batteries that operate those vehicles somehow emerged from God and plunked into the vehicle. I mean, seriously, some, there were emissions created making those batteries. It's just, it's just awful having those vehicles drive around. Or take teaching awards. 
you know, they have masses of these teaching awards in universities. Here's how they work. You have to nominate yourself. You have to fill out about 17 pages of bump. And then they decide who the good teachers are by looking at the papers you've submitted. Here's my rule. If someone wins a teaching award in the university, they're not a good teacher. <laughs> it's not 100% true, but it's pretty close. Um, here's some other problems. Big bureaucracies in Australian universities. Big bureaucracies. VCs, DVCs, DVDVCs. Um, and the sort of central model, which comes from the basic Australian dislike of uh, federalism, you know, the one-size-fits-all love that Australians have, is most obvious in the universities. So in my law school, the center, the people who know nothing about running a law school, send down all these rules about um, who you can hire, how you're supposed to mark. They have this thing called criterion-based marking. It's just such a joke, I won't go into it. Um, who gets honors? It's just centralism run mad. Nothing like that when I taught law in New Zealand or Hong Kong or Canada. Um, it's what you call, there's this sort of managerialist mania. In part, it's driven by Commonwealth uh, government-imposed reporting rules, but not just that. The, the, the top people in Australian universities like they like this too. Um, so there's a massively over-bureaucratic nature of our universities. Let me put it this way. When the top people in an Australian university, the VCs and the good universities, are getting paid way more than the top people in Canadian universities and American universities and British universities, there's a, there's a potential problem. I say that as a pro-free market, small government guy. But in that article I wrote, I said, why doesn't the Abbott government pass a, you know, make a rule that every university has to report the top 25 salaries in their universities. They do it in Canada. They do it in public universities in the US. Here's the thing about all the top universities in Australia. If they were publishing the top 25 earners, they'd all be administrators. That's my guess anyway. Um, universities tend not to do cost benefit analysis. They like to do benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. This is where you ignore every plausible cost. And if there's a on the horizon somewhere there's a potential benefit, then you do it. The fact that it means that you treat academics' time as a free good or that you, know, you ignore every possible cost. Another way of looking at it is managing for failure. If 99 people are doing their job and one isn't, rather than deal with the one who isn't, you make a rule for everybody. Um, that's the sort of thing. So I think there'd be a lot of support for Mr. Pine if instead of just looking at the uh, revenue side of things, he actually looked at how things work within the universities. Canadian universities, if you do an arts degree, you're getting 20, you know, you're getting 50 or 60 people in a class. Uh, here, I mean, I teach four or 500 sometimes. So there's a really big problem. Often all these ranking things of universities, I don't know if you saw the latest one of the, Shang, the Shanghai one, it, it's all aimed at the natural sciences. It's all aimed at the graduate PhD level. 30% of the criterion is based on how many Nobel laureates your university has had or ever had. So the most cost-effective way to move up the ranking is to go and hire someone who's won a Nobel Prize and then just put them in the most expensive hotel you can find. It doesn't matter. Um, that's 30% of the criteria. Then there's a big chunk given to your papers in nature and science. Um, so the focus is on the natural science. Nothing wrong with that. But the idea it tells you anything about the good, whether you're going to have a good experience as an undergraduate student, it tells you nothing. The undergraduate experience in Australian universities is not good. It is not good. Um, and I've had a lot of undergraduates come up and tell me that. So we could really work on that. Here's another weird thing. In Australia, more than anywhere else I've ever taught, they have this unbelievable emphasis on getting grants. You apply to the Australian Research Council, the ARC. And this might make sense in the hard sciences where you're fighting for time with a super particle collider or something, and you have to put in a grant, and you have to mm -hmm. fill out 80 pages of forms. But it doesn't make any sense at all that you obsess about grants in the Australian universities. I'm not making this up. When you go for promotion in Australian universities, assume two academics who've published exactly the same. They've been in the same, they've got the same top level publications. The one who hasn't put in a grant and hasn't taken a penny of taxpayer money is considered a loser. The one who's put in grants all over the place and has all sorts of taxpayer money in order to achieve that that person is considered the star. And in fact, you have a very hard time getting promoted unless you're getting grants. Now that's partly because the universities in this country now have this huge bureaucracy that's geared towards helping you get grants. And if people aren't getting grants, they, they can't get paid. So you get in all this money just to pay the people who are helping you to get the grants. Um, and I'm, that's barely a caricature. 
the last government brought in a research assessment exercise, cost uh, tens of millions of dollars. Um, the universities like you as a senior academic to be involved, so I, I did. And in order to be involved, you had to sign a waiver that you would never talk about it. So um, I'm going to speak hypothetically, <laughs> just on a totally unrelated topic. Although I encouraged Tony Abbott and Mr. Pine to waive people so they can actually, but this was a research ass assessment exercise it was going to tell us the quality of research that's coming out of Australian universities. Here's the one rule in life that my kids are here and everybody should learn. You never ever in life go wrong with shameless flattery. So when they come back and report that there are eight world leading law schools in Australia or five and another eight that are just below world leading level, I mean, who are we kidding? You know, the best universities in the world are American ones because they have so much money. You can fit Oxford, Cambridge in the top 50, and then in terms of the kind of university experience you're getting and the people that are teaching you, all the rest are American. But they do these sort of ranking exercises so that you can pretend that's not the case because they're measuring things that sort of make sense in the hard sciences if you're doing a PhD. Uh, and then lastly, let me just talk about the flip side of this. A huge number of Australian students, when they go to university, are working in paid employment. This is not the case. In law school in Canada, which has been on sabbatical or the US, nobody works, or at least nobody has the brave effrontery to tell people they're working. You're a full-time student. You're working full-time at your degree. In Australia, nobody even pretends anymore that the students in full-time university are doing anything other than working a lot on the side. I get emails from students, I can't make your class, I'm working. Um, I can't imagine that you'd do that if you're a lawyer about to go to court. I can't make the hearing. I've got another job. Um, and so this means that expectations in Australia are certainly lower than they are overseas, in my view. They're lower because they have to be lower, because people are really not focusing full time on university. And compared to things like Oxford, Cambridge, or the Ivy League, they are really low here. We are under unspoken pressure just to keep making it a bit easier. Um, so I think uh, we have problems in our universities. Some degrees are still really good. We still, we're turning out a lot of people with degrees, unfortunately, that don't seem that good to me. I mean, um, you get graduated with a women's studies degree. I'm not sure where that's going to place you. Uh, I like a good liberal arts degree. You get classics, you get philosophy, but a lot of the departments in some universities now have basically turned into grievance studies departments. And when you're an employer and someone fronts up with four years experience in making grievances, not sure that they're top of the list. Um, so here's the last thing I finish with. Inside our universities, outside of the top layer of the administration, across the political spectrum, people think there's a problem. So in a way, it's a, I'm giving you a contrarian view for what you might think based on what you're reading in the papers. But it's not a contrarian view inside the universities amongst the people who work there. Um, the, the bureaucracy is out of control. The monetary incentives, I think, are slightly wrong. Um, and when governments look to fix universities, they tend to talk to vice chancellors. That doesn't seem like the right way to go about it to me. At any rate, so that's my contrarian view, and I'm happy to take questions on any of the earlier things or uh, universities. And now hand over to Tony Moore, who's going to uh, take you on a slightly different direction. Thank you.